how, how do you feel as I read out your writing in front of an audience and having it being read back to you? How does that feel for you? Like, wow, did I honestly write that? <laughs> no, it is, it actually, it's still moves me and I think you know we say and I wrote that at the end of last year but um, the people I'm talking to and have been chatting to and my own patients you mentioned earlier that when the clock kind of clicks over to the next year we don't just leave behind and we haven't people are still actually exhausted and like I was saying to you earlier what's fascinated me is I honestly believe that that post had a timeline. I thought 31st of December and that'll be it, no more shares. It's still being shared, which says to me that collectively most of us or many of us are still feeling that way. And I think that, and as I said then, and I still hold on to this belief so passionately, is that we have to begin with understanding the space that we're in um, because with only when we understand can we have compassion. And that's what we need for healing. We need compassion on ourselves. And then, of course, we can move it and have compassion on others. It's a great answer. And I want to follow on from that with how you're viewing the current mental health landscape, not only in South Africa, around the world. I had a great time with you today in that you landed in Joburg this morning and we spent these long patches driving together. And so we had endless chats about this topic. But how would you surmise where we stand on the spectrum across the board around mental health? Is it, it seems to me that we are in an absolute crisis, but the world is not, they're picking it up intrinsically, but not necessarily, you're not necessarily seeing all people at companies and every, every in between going, hey, this, we gotta do something about this. How would you see it? Absolutely, and I do, I mean, we've seen rates of depression and anxiety increase across the board. So in all age groups and globally, um, and I've been contacted literally by people across the world sharing that the mental health resources, there are not enough mental health resources to support people's needs at the moment. So it is so significant. And my concern is that, yes, we're getting the schools, we're getting the businesses who are saying, hey, can we do something on mental health here? But if we do not prioritize it across the board in every single sphere, we are already in a crisis. And I shudder to think where we're gonna be in 10 years time, in 20 years time. It is essential that we stop and look at where we are, where we've come from. We can't sweep away the last few years. We can't just sweep it under the carpet. So, so important that we take stock of it and actually own it. And I think here, we know that in order for healing to happen, we need to be talking. We need to be using the language. We need to be making ourselves and finding the courage to be vulnerable. Healing comes when we can be vulnerable enough to own the spaces that we are in, to talk about them with one another, not to sweep them under the carpet. I always kind of have a visual analogy in my head with the more we sweep, and I think we're tending to do that because of this hamster wheel that actually I think has gotten even faster this year than it was last year. But the more we sweep, you keep sweeping under a rug, eventually there's a mountain and you're going to trip on it. And it becomes harder and harder to get up the bigger that mountain is. Are you feeling that? Or am I the only asshole? <laughs> How do we uncliche, if that's a word, mental health? Right, because you know, these terms get thrown around I have a happiness workshop, you and I have been talking about this, so I see it especially with men, as an example. Um, for, the mo for the duration of most of the happiness workshop, the ratio of men to women in that workshop that attend is almost like 80-20 to females. When I ask my own friends, for example, to come by, you just see that like, eh. it's almost like either the answer is, I don't have feelings, what's that? or just, I don't need it. So how do you think, Naomi, that we go around getting the masses, and especially men in this case, to actually get to that vulnerability, so to speak? I think I've, also, I've been encouraged because recently I've seen more and more men attending my workshops, my parenting, and I do I also think it does, it goes right back to parenting. We've got to look at how are we raising our boys. You know, that traditional way of raising them was boys don't cry. That's absolute rubbish. As human beings, we need to know, and we need to be raising kids in homes where they are safe to express 
absolutely any emotion. Emotions are so important. Otherwise, the result is, of course, depression and anxiety. And so many of the older teens, the adults that I work with who've been raised in homes where emotions have not been expressed, haven't been allowed, or have been punished, are depressed and anxious. So we really need to be, and I think the more that we are brave enough to have the, I mean, this event is just awesome because it's a conversation where we can all just own and honestly and authentically own the spaces that we're in. Not pretend everything's fine. Not, you know what we also see, and I think we, we're all seeing it, is this rush to kind of move ahead, forget what was, and it's all fine. You know, we need to focus forward. Absolutely, we need to focus forward. But as human beings, unless we can weave into our lives what has been, and actually be courageous enough to stand up, all of us, men, women, um, and say how it was and how we're feeling and the impact that it has had on us, well, we can't move forward. And unfortunately, we see that so many people only look for help and own it when they've actually already broken. It doesn't have to get to that point. And that's, again, if we're looking at tonight leaving here, and our hope, my hope, is that you'll leave here feeling more empowered um, through both of these talks, that it begins by just standing up and going, this is how I'm feeling. And it's OK, because this isn't a woman way to feel or female way to feel. This is a human. It's part of our humanity and it's beautiful and it's how we really begin to heal is just by being courageous enough to stand up and own our spaces. Hey. <laughs> I mean I did ask and you delivered. <laughs> I, I particularly agree with you here is that I'm noticing in my own life in, with my friends even with me is that at a point we we wait until everything is fully broken and we've got some broken stories in our head running already that, for example, if you start working on your mental health, you're admitting total defeat as opposed to becoming a better version of yourself. And you know, something that stuck with me a few years ago, it actually related to being a business coach, uh, a guy that I was working with. He said to me like, you know, the best tennis player in the world has a coach. It's not because he's a shit tennis player because he wants to get better. And if the best can have a whole coaching staff around them, like why are we looking down on anything from therapy, chats like this? We don't, like when I run the happiness workshop, people come to me and they go, especially the guys, they're like, but I'm already happy. I'm like, so you've reached the pinnacle of happiness? Like there's nothing more to learn? And I think that as you talk about like, making this conversation more okay and less cliched so that we, we don't have to see it as, oh, I'm hopefully broken and now I'm starting. So I wanna put this to you. If I come to you today and I say to you, Naomi, I've read your, your post there, where do I start? Help me run through almost a guide if I can and I wanna let you kinda of take center stage here, right? Because I want the audience to get as much out of the next 20 minutes or so as possible. So maybe if you could just start sharing some of the pointers and the things that you're thinking about in terms of how do we elevate ourselves mentally and emotionally from the space that we're currently in or we've been over the last three years. Wow, there's a whole lot of info there. Um, sure, I think um, to begin with is absolutely to look, relook at, as you said, let's just relook at mental health. We know, and there's just so much research that, that kind of confirms this, but when are we our best selves? when our mental health is where it should be. When do kids perform the best at school? In sporting, academically, it's when their mental health is in a good space. When do businesses actually do the best? It's not when their staff are falling to pieces and working like dogs without looking out. It's when they're looking after their mental health. So again, just so important why we re-look at this. But I think that, so there's a couple of, I'm just gonna put the first one out there. I think we should all be having pajama days, quite frankly, because <laughs> I don't think that we, 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 and that is really just, you know, I don't wanna even use the word mental health days, but days where we just can kind of say, I'm stopping, I'm taking a pause, I'm stepping off this hamster wheel because we don't breathe enough. Now, even from a neurological perspective, we know that in times of trauma, in times of stress, um, we need to get back to homeostasis. And one of the fastest ways to get back to homeostasis is actually by oxygenating the body. But most of the time, because we live in such a high stressed pace, it's go, 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 it's crisis, it's load shedding, it's a water cut, it's this breaks, that actually we're constantly in the state of hyper arousal. 
And by stopping, and this is a, I think that we should be setting our, our phone, I mean, we all carry the things, let's, let's really utilize them for our mental health. Every couple of hours, setting an alarm that goes off just to check in with where we are at in our bodies and actually to focus, am I breathing okay? Because most of the time, if you check, your breathing's probably pretty shallow. So that's just really something that, that is so simple, but I think so powerful that we need to be doing. And then to just, I mean, we can go further, but it's, a, it's about um, something else that I, that I was chatting to Mark about earlier, which um, I really think we need to, re we talk in psychology about the circle of control. Well, I'm a very visual person, so I like to think of it as the donut of control. If you think about that outer ring and there's an inner ring, well, so often our stress is way up there because we're focusing on that outer ring of things that we cannot control. They're out of our control. What the government is doing, the load shedding schedules, what the other driver at the traffic light is doing. The only things that we can control and when our freedom comes in is when we can let go of that outer ring and really refocus on what is in my circle of control, which is exactly what you were saying earlier. And that really is my response, my actions, what I do, what I say. And here's things in here, also comes into things that I'm so passionate about and I believe the healing of our world is, is it's critically based on these things. And the one is not to judge others. You know, I think we judge people so easily, but we don't know their story. Everybody's got a story, and when we stop and pause and think, what is their story? The thing is, none of us know, because none of us have woken up in someone else's shoes. And for me, that's always, I know, I'm human to you, like, Rah! if we just pause, think, what, what could their reason be? There's always a valid reason. Even the angriness, and I did a post on it a while ago, I called it Sangry. This was kind of a discussion that came up with my 10-year-old and I. But I believe that we're living in a world that is very angry at the moment, understandably, because at the core of, you know, anger is the only human emotion that is not what, what it is. It's the layered, I call it the onion emotion. Um, you go, anger is that outer emotion that it is the defense against vulnerability. It keeps people away from us when we're feeling really, really vulnerable. But underneath it, when we start peeling off those layers, we get sadness, we get pain, we get fear of rejection, we get other emotions. At the core is always disempowerment. So when we can reframe other people's anger um, like that and anybody else's responses, just at the core so often is disempowerment. And the other thing that I believe that we is in every single one of our potential to do is kindness. It's the smallest acts of kindness that have the most powerful impact. It's things like greeting the cashier, like speaking to the petrol attendant and just finding out how their day was. It's those small things. And by the way, when we talk about, and Wayne, I think he's gonna just blow your mind with what he's got to say, but talk about things that we can do. We know that from a helping perspective, when we are feeling so disempowered and the essence of trauma, as we've just all experienced, is disempowerment at the core of it. it dis trauma disconnects us from ourselves and from one another. So really looking at how do we re-empower ourselves? And it's in the small, small ways. And by helping others, we actually empower ourselves. We know that there's something called a helper's high, actually that neurologically you get more of a kickoff when you help someone else, actually, than they, than they get. And obviously that's not why we help, but isn't that awesome to know that even physiologically the changes are happening. Uh, the proof is there of where healing actually comes from. And this kind of stuff, it excites me because it's so doable. I, and we can see it, uh, and I love it. <laughs> you said something to me in the car that really hit a spot for me about inaccessibility. Mm. Would you give them some context? Because I thought that that was just, <laughs> it's like such a small thing that's so yeah. powerful. I think, oh, I was saying to Mark that, you know, I get a lot of people who will say to me, um, why are you away so often? And I say, because that is the only time that in my line of work, I'm actually inaccessible. And if we think about the stress on all of us, one of the problems with our beautifully modern and technologically savvy world is that we are constantly accessible 24 seven. And there's the expectation from everyone else that we are accessible. That puts a huge amount of stress and then anxiety. So even if you take kind of an hour and just go to gym or go have a quiet lunch 
challenge, you know that there's people who are going to be wondering why you weren't accessible during that time. And I think another really important part of our own mental health and looking after ourselves is that we boundary and strictly boundary times of inaccessibility and not feel guilty for them. It's essential. So yes, it might not be going away, but maybe it's taking an hour off, switching your phone off, going to sit under a tree, going to have a cup of coffee, and actually knowing that that, from a mental health perspective, is so important. Finding inaccessibility in a world that is constantly demanding our accessibility. Yeah, and I mean, I couldn't agree with you more, but we were talking about it in the car, because I do this thing where I wake up at like, say, five o'clock in the morning, my body clock just kicks me up, and there's a beautiful thing about doing some work from about 5.30 to 7.30. No one can contact me. I can't get hunted from different people. It's amazing. So what I tend to do is do my work first. Then I get ready and I go to gym. Sometimes I go to gym at 8.30 or 9. Two things happen. I can at least get some work done without anybody bothering me. And I avoid the mad rush at gym. Obviously, I work for myself. What is crazy to me is the amount of pushback I get if I said I'm at gym from 9 to 10. It's almost like... What the fuck do you mean you were at gym? You should be at work. You should be, be answering my phone call. You should be, and my attitude is like, I've seen if I don't take that hour for me, my whole day goes in the opposite direction. But of course, any time that you put a boundary in place, you get resistance. So how do you deal with that? Well, I think we have to redefine, and I get asked that question often, like, what do we do about boundaries? Because we feel guilty about boundaries. But boundaries are really just there to keep us safe, and they're essential for preserving our mental health. You know, we talk about boundaries, and then we get pushback for boundaries, but I always like to use the analogy of a home. I mean, you hear, and why do we have, uh, what, how do we feel when we don't have the electric fences, the alarms, live in the estates, etc.? We feel hugely unsafe and insecure. Boundaries are essential. So we have to redefine why we're putting them into place. And people respect the boundaries that we put into place. Yes, they're gonna kick back at first because they're probably not used to us putting them there. Yes. But, um, but, when, but when we put them into place, they soon actually realize, I mean, I did a post on boundaries on my social media, as I was saying to Mark earlier today, a couple of weeks ago. Didn't know what the response would be, but I put boundaries in place there. And so many people came back and said, thank you. We feel like this is a safer space because you've put the boundaries in place, because we know what to expect from you and what you expect from us. So everybody feels safer when there's boundaries. Sure. It's, when you said electric fences and alarms, and it's kind of the equivalent of we feel safer when we have that, the boundary walls of the home, it's for safety. One of the things that I've been speaking about in my happiness workshop for a long time, but it's easy to talk about, hard to do is, I guess there's no other way to put it, learning to not, choo learning to choose to not give a fuck what certain people think. Because I'm convinced that half of the issue that we're facing is simply that we want to be loved, accepted, valued, and respected by everyone. But you can't have that at the same time as putting up these boundaries. And so we almost feel pushed away by people when they're not liking us. So we will make ourselves largely unhappy by chasing after the affections and attention of people, all people, and then find ourselves unhappy. Are you seeing that in your practice? Are you seeing that right now? How, in other words, how do people figure out beyond putting boundaries up, how to be okay with people not being okay with those boundaries or not being liked by everybody. What advice would you give to people who are particularly, I've had it my whole life mm. up until recently where I, I really crave people liking me. Mm. And so I find myself being down in the dumps at times when I get a lot of flack online or what have you. So I think this is, there's so much more to this. And interestingly, I also, I don't do a whole day workshop on happiness, but I do do an hour talk on it. And one of the things that we discuss is, yes, what so many is, I mean, we see it. We see it, especially, I think, with women and with teen girls is this, and I think social media has a big part to play here. We scroll through, say, and I say to people, pick up your phones, phones, go through the people that you follow. Just, just go through, and I give them like two minutes. And I say, okay, how are you feeling? And most often, they're left feeling not good enough. Why? Because they've seen what other people have put on. But what do we, and this is why I go back to my, my absolute passion about we need to be being authentic and real. 
which is why, okay, my tech skills are not good, but so often there's like no filters, there's nothing. This is just me as I am. And I post about my stuff ups in life, in parenting. Why? Because that's real. We compare ourselves as human beings to what is not real. Why? People are putting up their just salon looks, their filtered looks, their perfect life. And I've seen this in my practice, and I remember years ago, um, it, it, it's a, some, I remember seeing a couple. They were on the verge of divorce and walked out of my office the next day on social media, there was a picture of them that the wife had posted, oh my darling, I love you forever. Okay. And I thought, that's exactly it. But these are, this is what we are all exposed to. This picture on social media, that is not reality. It's like the tip of the iceberg that doesn't exist. Here's the thing, and that's why we also need to be just owning our spaces, because perfection does not exist anywhere. It doesn't, but we compare ourselves and then we're like, oh, I'm not good enough. And the more real we are, the more we just, I think the, the, the better we feel about ourselves, own our space, and are okay to not be okay in any form, the more confident we are, the more we can put our real selves out there and kind of move beyond that. And I love, I remember hearing and actually chatting to a colleague of mine, it was years ago, and I've never forgotten this, and she just said, you know what, We'd be like stick in your lane. And I, I, I kind of, again, use the visual analogy of put those horse blinkers on, focus on you and what you're doing and what you're putting out there into the world. That is what counts. We get so distracted from actually everything about what we can be doing, how we can be helping others, the impact that we can make in the world, we get so distracted when we start worrying about everyone else's opinions. What am I missing here, Naomi? In the last few months, I have just been feeling just so overwhelmed, which is what made me resonate with your post. I feel like if it's not corporate issues, if it's not load shedding, then I have water, I don't have water at home, then I get a high water bill when I don't have water at home, then staff are sick and now I'm under pressure, then a corporate's not paying me on time. So what I'm getting at is that there's these, it feels to me at times, even for me, that there are these punches coming my way just for being South African. And I don't think I'm alone. And it does. It, it, it's that wearing down. There are days, honestly, where I just sit here and I, I want to pull my fucking hair out. So, and I've got a lot of hair. <laughs> so it'll take a while. Lucky you. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out these steps, right? And I know it's, it's almost cruel to give someone like half an hour and then make them give this highlights package. But what am I missing? What are they missing that they need to hear from you tonight? Even two or three things outside of what you've said, that when they walk out of here tonight or tomorrow morning when they wake up and they're thinking about it, what are those things? I think firstly what you mentioned is you feel so frustrated. You've got to just let yourself feel that way. And that's kind of what we also touched on is that I think sometimes we feel these huge overwhelming emotions and we're like, no, no, I shouldn't be feeling this, like snap out of it. Actually emotions, I like to think of them, they're just waves. Just embrace what comes. And by the way, even from a neurological perspective, we know that by owning it and by naming it and going, okay, this is how I'm feeling right now, it actually shifts the space in our brains um, where it's from this intense feeling to more being able to process our emotions rationally. Um, so actually just to own it. I know a simple example here is um, in the car, and I've actually, because I'm teaching my kids to do this too, but mm, we know the drivers in South Africa, and I get stuck behind someone, or someone's like, ah! it's not that I don't feel it, but I'll actually verbalize it. So I'll say out loud, yeah, I'm feeling so frustrated right now, and I'm gonna do my regulated breathing. I'm trying to teach my kids about regulation and dysregulation, and even my little one, she gets it confused sometimes, but she's got it, and she said to me the other day, are you trying to dysregulate? She actually meant regulate. I said, no, no, love, I'm trying to regulate. But literally by breathing in, call it straw breathing, and breathing out again, it, it helps. But in that breath, I think that's where the second, so the first point is just let yourself feel whatever you're feeling. No emotion. You know, we also, we are raised believing there's good emotions and there's bad emotions. There's like things we should feel more of and there's things we should feel less of. Rubbish. We're human beings. We were made to experience life. And with that, living is actually just experiencing every single emotion. It's a part of the messy, beautiful journey of life. 
So just own it. I'm feeling this way. I know that I sometimes have, well, during the pandemic, I call them pandemic days, whatever you want to call them, call them. But just to know, right, this is how I'm feeling. I'm owning it. And tomorrow will be different. Or this is the space I'm in. And once I've done my dysregulated breathing, I'll, I'll, I'll feel differently. But with that breath, and then to literally say, okay, let it go. And here's the thing, the other thing that I think in South Africa and in many countries in the world, but especially we, yes, there's so much positivity, but there's also so much negativity. And we are swamped by it. You just drive down the road and there's the billboards. You pick up your WhatsApp and someone on the family group is moaning and complaining about something. And it is just presses one down. And by the way, one of the best pieces of advice I can give to you as a side note is unfollow. Anybody that any um, kind of page that is not making you feel better about yourself or is bringing on the negativity, unfollow them. Um, but really to look at, okay, what is in my, can I do something about this? If I can, get actively involved and do something. If I can't, instead of bitching and moaning about it or complaining, let it go. Either let it go or do something about it. And I think that honestly, that helps me so much. Feel it. Feel it. Be overwhelmed by it. Oh, goodness. This is. There you go. I love that because the, I love it when things go wrong and talks that I'm doing. Because, like, this was, this was the, what the pandemic uh, taught. Is it off, off again? again? Off again. Awesome. You had it. You had, I had it, there. it. And then I lost it because of the Just pandemic. With the hair. There we go. Here, here. There you go. If the pandemic taught taught us anything and taught me anything, it's like things go wrong, especially in technology. You just got to like wing it, go with it, and it's all okay in the end. Yeah. <laughs> the, the feeling I apart from me, Naomi, is, is so on point. Um, I think of it, I really do think that there is such a thing as toxic positivity. This idea that you have to be on all the time with a smile on your face all the time. And so we told all the time like, hey, chin up, just look, you know, face forward. And it's like, fuck you, I wanna feel what I'm feeling right now. I'm, I'm, I'm. And we have a deal with my team and I, it doesn't always work, but for the most part it does. That sometimes I just have my resting bitch face on for the day. And like, I just need to feel it. I'm in, a pla I'm in a place. Don't tell me to feel better. I'm feeling it. But the one thing that has really helped me, which I think you're alluding to there, is I always do try to make a deal with myself before I go to bed at night. It's like, okay, you felt it now. Like, you've, you've, you've sat in it all day, sitting in the fire of that emotion. And then it's like, okay, well, tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to have another crack again. But the, again, the hard part is that other people are constantly even well-meaningly, right? My team, they're not bad people. They're like, it's hard seeing you like this sometimes. And I'm like, I know, but I need to feel this for a day. Otherwise, I'm going to go let someone down, someone's tires down and burn Eskom's building down. <laughs> so the feeling thing for me really got it. I want to leave you with a, a parting thought, if I can. I want you to leave the audience with a parting thought, if you can. You're, you're kind of swan song and, and grand finale. We could sit here honestly for youngs. But what is the last thing that you want people to think about and how would you like them to leave tonight and wake up tomorrow morning and do? What is that, like that one thing? Wow. As you said, we could go on and on and on. I think the word that comes to mind is compassion because I don't think we are being compassionate enough with ourselves. And until we are compassionate with ourselves, we actually cannot be compassionate with one another. That means allowing ourselves to have days where things are not always okay. Allowing ourselves to have those face days, whatever they may be, and not feeling guilty for them. Why not? It's just, it's a part of the human experience. And when we can have enough compassion to not judge ourselves, not feel guilty about it, just own it and walk through it. And I think the more we can do that, it also gives us more empathy for when others and gives us more allowance to allow others to have those compassionately. And maybe something that's just come to mind, which I found because there are so many struggling people out there, and it's our human nature to want to fix things, that sometimes when we can't fix, and actually even more powerful than being able to fix is just to be able to say, I'm here. 
and to sit in the space of another struggling human being without trying to say anything, trying to do anything, or trying to fix it. Just so that they know that there is the presence of someone who can sit in my overwhelming emotions without trying to shift the space that I'm in. That is so healing. So. <laughs> I want to just say thank you. From the very first day that we met digitally, you were compassionate. A funny thing happened. Nicola sent me that, that link to your post. And I come from a digital marketing background. And so what I do with a lot of these posts is that I will take, I took your writing, for example, that day, and I shared it on my Facebook profile and I put written by Naomi Holt at the bottom, and I cleaned it up a bit in my formatting and put a different picture. And what happened was that a lot of people thought I wrote it, because they don't read. <laughs> <laughs> and normally this would not be an issue, because you would put a post up, and like it would get a few likes, and that would be over, right? It wouldn't be. But then this post took on a life of its own on my Facebook page, and then I started getting attacked by people. And then the first thing I actually thought about was like, fuck, now she's going to think that I'm trying to steal her work. <laughs> yeah. And so I reached out to you and I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I, did, I, wasn't, I didn't think this was going to go anywhere. Like, I just posted this. And you were nothing but kind. And then we hopped on a Zoom call. And we got speaking and I said, but really this, this post of yours really resonated with me. And I've got this event and would you be interested? And you were. And then I was having a little bit of a meltdown for the first two weeks of the, the year, and I went a touch silent on you, and you were just compassionate. And then you flew in here, you took the time to be here. The reason we can run this as a free event is because Naomi didn't charge us to be here. She gave of her time, and not just of her time to be here tonight, but she flew in this morning, and she's here to share. And I feel that that's you living your compassion. So just to let you know, one of the things that we're going to be doing is sitting in that studio up there tomorrow for a lot longer than a half an hour, where we can really get into the nitty gritty. And it acts as actually a recording as a follow up to this highlights package half an hour, 30 minutes. So I think sometimes it is cruel to take such a broad topic, which it is, and deny the person that, like, I, I always turn down 20 minute, 30 minute talks. I'm just like, I'm not interested. There's not enough time to get into the heart of it. But you did it anyway, so we'll be recording a much longer version of this kind of chat and releasing them at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, Naomi Holt. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.